Imagine for a moment a world without the compass, without hospitals, without universities, without algebra, without scientific experimentation, or even without the very concept of peer-reviewed knowledge. It might sound impossible, yet there was a time when such things didn't exist. And then from the sands of Arabia to the libraries of Andalusia, from the streets of Baghdad to the observatories of Samarkand, a civilization rose with one mission, to seek knowledge because their faith demanded it. The world remembers bits and pieces, names like Avicenna or Averroes, but behind those famous figures lies a vast ocean of untold stories, the forgotten brilliance of ancient Islamic scholars who reshaped humanity's understanding of science, philosophy and spirit. These were not just scientists or philosophers, they were believers whose hearts beat with the conviction that learning was an act of worship, their pursuit of knowledge was not for fame or recognition, it was for Allah. They believed every discovery was a step closer to understanding the Creator's perfection. The Quran did not just inspire them to pray, it inspired them to ponder. When they read, do they not look within themselves? Or indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth are signs for those who reflect. They took it literally. They saw reflection as devotion, they saw logic as faith in motion. Let's begin in Baghdad, centuries ago, during the golden age of Islam. The air was alive with the sound of scholars debating, scribes copying manuscripts, and translators working tirelessly in the famous Bayt al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom. Imagine walking into that grand hall filled with scrolls and manuscripts from Greece, Persia, India, and beyond. There, Muslim scholars didn't just translate, they transformed knowledge, they analyzed, tested and expanded it, turning the wisdom of past civilizations into the foundation for modern science. Among them was Al-Kindi, often called the philosopher of the Arabs, but few know his deeper story. Al-Kindi was one of the first to bridge philosophy and Islam, showing that faith and reason were not enemies but companions. He wrote hundreds of works on mathematics, astronomy, logic, and even music therapy. He taught that music could heal the soul and influence emotions long before psychology existed as a field. Yet Al-Kindi's brilliance was matched by his humility. He once said, we should not be ashamed to acknowledge truth from whatever source it comes, for truth is the property of God. Imagine that mindset a scholar who saw truth not as a cultural possession, but a divine gift to be shared. And then came Al-Khwarizmi, the man whose name gave birth to the word algorithm. Think about that. The foundation of every modern computer, every search engine, every digital system, traces back to a Muslim mind in the 9th century. Al-Khwarizmi's works on algebra didn't just revolutionize mathematics, they reshaped human thought. The term algebra, from which algebra is derived, came from his writings. He introduced methods of solving equations that formed the bedrock of modern engineering, architecture and physics. Yet his work wasn't just about numbers, it was about balance, justice and precision, values deeply rooted in the Quranic worldview. Travel a bit east to Bukhara, and you'll find another giant, Abu Ali ibn Sina, known to the West as Avicenna. By the age of 18, he had mastered nearly every known science of his time. But what people rarely mention is his deep spirituality. Ibn Sina believed that studying medicine and nature was a way of glorifying Allah. His canon of medicine became Europe's primary medical textbook for over 500 years. He was the first to describe contagious diseases, how emotions affect health, and even the anatomy of the human eye. Yet after all his achievements, Ibn Sina would often withdraw in solitude to pray and reflect, admitting that the more he learned about creation, the more he realized how little he knew about the Creator. That humility is what separated Islamic scholarship from secular curiosity. Then there was Ibn al-Haytham, a man centuries ahead of his time, 
often called the father of modern optics, but his story is even more remarkable. During the rule of the Fatimid Caliph in Egypt, he proposed to control the flooding of the Nile using a grand dam. When the project failed due to the scale of the river, the Caliph grew furious, and Ibn al-Haytham pretended to be insane to save his life. Confined to his home for 10 years, he used that solitude to conduct experiments on light, lenses, and human vision. He discovered that the eye perceives light through rays entering it, not the other way around, as the Greeks believed. But more importantly, he laid down the scientific method, observation, hypothesis, testing, and conclusion. That's right, the very structure of modern science was developed by a Muslim who saw experiment as a form of worship. He once wrote, I seek truth, and the truth is from God. From light, let's move to the stars. The name Al-Biruni doesn't come up often in textbooks, but it should. He calculated the Earth's circumference with incredible precision using shadows and geometry. Centuries before satellites confirmed it, he mapped the globe, studied planetary motion, and understood time zones when much of the world still thought the Earth was flat. He learned Sanskrit to study Indian texts and wrote comparative works on astronomy and philosophy that blended cultures with respect and depth. His curiosity knew no borders, and his respect for all sources of knowledge mirrored Islam's teaching that wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he is most deserving of it. But perhaps one of the most inspiring figures was Fatima al-Firi. She wasn't a scientist or philosopher in the usual sense, but her contribution changed the course of education forever. She founded the University of al qurawiyyin in Fez, Morocco, in the year 859, a university that still exists today. Recognized by UNESCO, as the world's oldest continuously operating university. Her story is a reminder that women were not sidelined in the intellectual journey of Islam, they were central to it. Fatima's vision was simple yet profound, to build a place where faith and knowledge coexist, where spiritual and worldly sciences are studied side by side, and her legacy continues, proving that the pursuit of knowledge is a sacred right for both men and women. In Andalusia, the story takes another fascinating turn. Cordoba shone like a jewel of civilization, its streets lit at night, its libraries filled with half a million books at a time, when London had barely a few hundred. Scholars like Ibn Rushd Averroes and Ibn Zur of Enzur expanded medicine, ethics and philosophy. Ibn Rushd's commentaries on Aristotle revived philosophy in Europe and helped ignite the Renaissance. He showed that there was no contradiction between revelation and reason, only between ignorance and understanding. Yet, even as he faced exile for his views, he remained steadfast in his belief that faith and intellect are two wings of the same bird, both essential for the soul to soar. And what about al zarawi the father of modern surgery. In his 30-volume medical encyclopedia, he described surgical instruments and procedures so advanced that they were used in Europe for centuries. He introduced sutures using animal intestines, described caesarean sections, and detailed dental treatments. Yet, before every surgery, he would pray, knowing that healing ultimately comes from Allah, not from the hands of the surgeon. His humility once again reflected the essence of Islamic knowledge. It was never about pride, but purpose. These are the untold stories, stories of people who saw no boundary between the mosque and the laboratory, between revelation and reason. Their curiosity wasn't rebellion, it was reverence. They saw the universe as an open book of signs from Allah, waiting to be read. For them studying the laws of nature, was not an act of arrogance, but of all. Every discovery was a reflection of divine order. Yet today we often forget these roots. We see science and faith as separate paths, when in truth, they were always one. 
The Islamic civilization that nurtured these scholars did not ask, is this religious or scientific? It asked, is this truth? And wherever truth was found, it was seen as a sign of Allah's wisdom. Imagine if we revived that spirit today. Imagine young Muslims not seeing faith as a limit, but as a launch pad for exploration. Imagine universities where the Quran and quantum physics are studied side by side, where ethics and engineering share the same hall. That is not a dream, it is a legacy waiting to be reclaimed. Because the truth is, the golden age of Islam wasn't golden because of its inventions or libraries. It was golden because of its mindset. A mindset that said, knowledge is light, and light belongs to God. Those scholars didn't study for status. They studied to serve, they didn't seek recognition. They sought revelation. So the next time someone says that Islam and science are at odds, Remember the men and women who built observatories beside mosques, who healed bodies while nurturing souls, who calculated the stars while glorifying their maker. Remember that the very essence of Islamic scholarship was built upon curiosity, guided by faith. And remember perhaps the greatest untold story of all is that every Muslim today carries that same potential to rediscover, to rethink, and to rise again, just as those scholars once did. The light of their knowledge never went out. It still burns quietly in the verses of the Quran that call us to reflect, to seek, to understand. It waits for hearts courageous enough to ignite it again. And when we do, the world will once more witness the power of a people who learn not to boast, but to believe.